starting now. And Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Jackie Ely. I'm from the Department of Finance and the Procurement Facilitator for the Out of Home Care Process. Before we commence today's session, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Wajuk Nungor people, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Okay, we will be taking questions during the session today. Please type your questions into the chat box during the webinar and we will be answering chat box questions today where appropriate. If we aren't able to answer questions today through the chat box, we will take your questions on notice and issue them via an addendum. Please do not ask questions already submitted before the session. We are working to distribute the answers as soon as possible um, and that will be hopefully be issued via an addendum later on this week hopefully by close of business tomorrow. The recording will be made available after the session via an addendum as well. And also answers to all questions taken on notice will be issued via an addendum later on next week. So in regards to today's session. Sorry. Communities have chosen a targeted approach with ACOs to procuring out of home care services. We want to see an increase in Aboriginal children and young people in out of home care being placed with ACOs where appropriate. Communities encourages you to submit an offer to this process. Once your offer is received, the evaluation panel will assess the content. At that point, the evaluation panel will engage with each ACO directly. It's important to note that all the information contained in your offer is treated as commercial in confidence and will not be disclosed to parties outside of the evaluation panel. Communities is committed to improving outcomes for children and young people in out of home care. And we want to work in partnership with ACOs to plan and deliver sustainable community services. It is important to note that when government contracts with the community service sector, that it is done so in a manner that supports sustainable and effective service delivery and recognising the importance of ongoing organisational viability. So as you are all aware, the tender application period, the closing time is 2.30pm on Thursday the 11th of August. We encourage you where possible to try and get your applications submitted, your offers submitted well in advance of this timeline. There can be no extension for technical delays. I've had a few questions already around offers that have already been uploaded onto Tenders WA and with the, in, with the distribution of addendums that people may wish to or choosing to amend their offers. Your offers can be withdrawn at any time before the 2.30pm closing date and then they can then be re-uploaded. There is contact within the request document. You can contact the procurement systems team and they will help and support you through this process. So please remember that if you have already uploaded your offer and then you want to make any amendments or any additions to your offer, you can do so. It's just a matter of withdrawing that offer and then re-uploading it. So the session, as we said, will, will be made available through Tenders WA um, via an addendum. We, are, we really look forward to reviewing the applications received and to working with the broad range of sector colleagues in the provision of contemporary out of home care services as we jointly aim to improve outcomes for WA's vulnerable children and young people. Any communication as always relate, relating to the request for tender is to be directed to myself, Jackie Ely, and my contact details are there. Again, advice on delivering your offers called tendering services um, and they are more than willing to help you as are the procurement system support um, on that number below there, and they are Department of Finance staff. What we would now like to hear from you, if you have any questions that you would like to put towards the panel today, we've got Amber with me here and Amar and Ben as well. 
So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat box. And as I say, we can then start the conversation, um, especially if you have any issues or concerns. If you haven't as yet submitted your offer or considering an offer, we want to encourage you to do so. Even if you don't feel like you're ready as yet to commence delivering services, we still want to hear from you. What we don't want you to do is to withhold submitting an offer because you don't feel like you have the appropriate tender writing skills. We know that grant applications have gone out there and they've been assessed and some organisations are opting to use that money um, to engage consultants to write tender applications. That's not a necessity and neither is it a necessity either to include additional materials such as movies or anything, anything else. That isn't a requirement. Um, it's, what we really want to hear is what you're able to deliver. So put as much of your thoughts down on, on paper in your offer as you possibly can. And as I said, this is um, you have been engaged through an expression of interest. It's a direct process, a direct engagement. It's very different to an open tender. And as I've said earlier on, that once the evaluation panel get your offers in, then we can start the conversations direct with each and every one of you. The most important thing is that you submit your offer to the Department of Communities by the closing time. If you do want to have a conversation um, offline today, then by all means, give me a call or send me an email and um, I can talk on a one on one basis with you. And if I'm not able to address any of your concerns or your queries or even answer your questions, I will certainly take them on notice and get back to you. Is there any questions in the chat box? Ask your question. No. <laughs> OK, so many of you are wondering is what is the difference between a direct process and an open tender process? A direct approach means that you already responded to an expression of interest that has already commenced the conversation that showed us that there is an interest with you as organisations to deliver out of home care services. That that direct approach was undertaken with ACOs because communities have identified that we want to increase the number of ACOs out there who, who can who are delivering or who could potentially deliver out of home care services. With an open tender approach, it is a very competitive process. We will not be engaging in, in these types of conversations with the community service organisations who have engaged in an open tender process. But once evaluation offers have been evaluated, then we may have conversations with them like we will with yourselves. The process with direct negotiation allows us to have those conversations, more detailed conversations, engage with the co-design, talk with you on an ongoing basis once um, the tender closes. Okay. The intent is that we bring on um, ACOs to deliver out of home care services. That is the priority for the Department of Communities, a priority for government. I am conscious that at this stage we haven't got any questions. Is there anybody there that would like to ask us anything at all? Is there anything you're not clear about? Is there anything that you're confused about? Or please, if there's any barriers to participate in the process, we also want to hear from you in regards to that as well. There are documents we will develop for the service, for example, care plans that would be improved through consultation with communities in implementation of the service. Will this be acceptable when evaluated at this point? <laughs> Absolutely. So we're not expecting you to be a fully developed service that completely understands our business. So we know that as ACOs you have enormous capability, but our our um, our work is niche work and you may not have had the chance to, to learn about our legislation and all of our processes. So as part of bringing um, new ACOs on board, we will absolutely be having a partnership approach. Um, there will be training that will occur um, preferably with your local district, especially if you're in the regions. Um, we'll have a range of modules as well as actually live training because there is a range of issues, um, a range of learning that you may not have been exposed to before. And so we really do want to make sure that we set you up. It's, it's part of our responsibility to set you up for success um, and enable you to be able to deliver 
those services to uh, children and young people that are in care that meets the legislative obligations that um, we have and that um, will be shared with you um, in undertaking care arrangements for children in the CEO's care. When can we expect the final addendums to be issued to feel secure to submit our application in advance of the deadline? We anticipate that um, whilst the questions keep coming in, we are obliged to answer those questions. Ideally, um, if we get questions very late on, um, i.e. a couple of days before closing date, and they, they, they may have an impact on um, offers that um, potentially will be submitted, then um, we are obligated to extend the closing time. However, we want to try and avoid um, extension to a closing date. Um, but if we have to, we will do. Um, we still have just over about three weeks still to, for you to get your um, your offers in. And I'm I'm hoping now that the um, the bulk of the questions, the core questions that we've received now have already come in um, and that um, the volume of questions that we have received um, will hopefully slow down. But as I say, if I don't want you to, to um, get too concerned about that because we are flexible. It is a flexible approach. We want to work in partnership with you. Um, we don't want to um, sort of set a closing date and then you're not able to um, and that might impact on your offer if an addendum goes out late. As I say, there is flexibility there to extend the closing date, not by a significant period, I have to say. It may be two, three days, depending on what that question is. OK, but as I say, we've had a lot of questions so far, I think probably around about 78 questions so far, um, which is fantastic because that was the reason why we had a long um, period where this was open open to the market and open to you as ACOs, because we wanted to give you a real opportunity to read through the, the request document to digest the contents and come up with the questions rather than just make assumptions and put an offer in, okay, within a four week timeline. So that was the whole idea of giving you an eight week timeline because as Amber said, it's a very niche area of the business. It's a very complex area of the business. And for a number of you out there, this will be the first time that one you've actually submitted, potentially be submitting a tender to government and also submitting a tender for out of home care services. So we welcome your questions and we want your questions to keep coming. But as I said, um, we may put a cutoff time on there a few days before. But if we receive a question that's significant, then we are obligated to extend, put an extension to that timeline. OK. The housing component is a big gap for us. We would not be in a position to provide houses for service delivery. Will this exclude us from being evaluated and or awarded a contract? Does that one? Yes. So housing is not associated to um, community foster care. That is a, a volunteer arrangement. And so part of being a community foster carer is that you need to have your own home. In terms of the other arrangements, um, so actually emergency foster care, emergency community care is also the same. So there is an expectation that as a, um, a volunteer carer, uh, you have your own home. But in terms of temporary care, um, group care and complex care, it is recognised um, that you may need a house. If you have a house, then the option is for you to be able to include that in your response. If you don't have a house, then let us know that. And um, we do have houses. So the family, family group homes, they currently exist. So we currently have homes across the state. Um, we have houses already that we can use for um, the group care program. So don't feel like you need to have a house to be able to submit, um, but make sure that you're clear on all the associated costings um, in terms of being able to set up that house. I think there has been a previous question around what um, what would be associated, what's what uh, costs for the agency versus what the department would be paying for. And I would encourage you to have a look back at that previous response. Um, but it's certainly not expected that you will have your own house for those care care types. I wonder if you can address a concern here that um, in providing well reasoned costings um, before some co-design is done, um, there's a concern that um, those costings might not be accurate um, ahead of those discussions of the co-design. We might need a bit more information on that question in terms yeah. of are we talking about the model of how 
um, there is to all it says here is we're concerned in providing well reasoned costings before some co design. OK, so there are, I, I'm going to make an assumption here. Um, I'm assuming it's about putting a price forward or pricing for these services. Um, what we would say to you is fill out the pricing table to the best of your ability, and then we can engage in discussions with you once your offer has been received. If we would like to provide a support service to foster care agencies, do we need to complete a full tender document? One of the care types, isn't it? Support service. No, it's not one of the care. The request document is focused on the care types, the five care type arrangement types in there. Any other care arrangements that fall outside of the scope of that? Um, well, I would say it's a different type of service. It's a different type of service delivery, so it doesn't fall within um, confines of what, what we're seeking here in this out of home care procurement process. And then following on from that, there's a question here about whether funding for therapeutic model is to be included in the tender, which I think falls outside the scope. Well, I would say that um, we're very interested to hear from um, agencies and, and especially ACOs, the model that um, you're going to provide to be able to um, provide this service to our children. So we're not anticipating, um, especially for group care and complex care, that you're just providing a bedroom. <laughs> it's actually, um, we are and are seeking from you your model, your therapeutic model. So it's important that that is included in your response. I might uh, just add on there. You may not be able to see you see me. It's Ben Whitehouse um, from the Department of Communities. The question was regarding providing a support service to foster carers. In those scenarios, that is an opportunity to partner um, with an with a uh, community sector, another sec community sector organisations, potentially a non-Aboriginal community sector organisation who does not have, by definition, the cultural competency or, or knowledge that an ACO can provide. So it may well be that the other organisation provides the care arrangement and you provide the foster care support to that, but that would need to come in a partnership um, uh, submission. Thanks. Great clarity, thank you, Ben. Would there be an opportunity for departmental staff to be seconded to ACOs in the early stages as an option? Ooh, what a great idea. I'll take it on notice. I think it's a fabulous idea. But I can't commit to resources at this point, but I really like it as an idea. Good thinking. There's an acknowledgement that we've had some um, technical issues um, outside of the agency and that some um, organisations tapping into this session today weren't able to hear. I um, want to acknowledge the, the global issues that Microsoft Teams has been having and that potentially um, that has prevented some people from taking full part in this session today. Um, however, we believe that the community's side of the technology has um, been able to capture both the visual and the audio and we'll have that uh, out to you in an addendum shortly for, um, for viewing from the beginning. Uh, the next question here is uh, for, the, it says the tender says that complex care has no department house. Can you confirm the department will provide complex care houses? Oh, Ben, can you um, clarify that for us? Complex care, we don't provide a house, is that right? That's correct. We don't provide a house with complex care. Having said that, uh, no, sorry, we don't provide a, a house with complex care. Thank you for clarifying. Great question. My apologies. One more. Should an ACO assess that the service is not feasible or sustainable through negotiation, co-design around costings or budgets post submission of their initial offer to the department, are they able to pull their offer? At what stage through the process could they do that? I'll take that question on notice. In terms of withdrawing offers at what stage? Okay, just so I can be 100% accurate in my response, I'm okay. 
is relationship discussion. Yeah. Um, I have no further questions available to ask. Can I just interject as well? Um, I think it's well, it's really important to note, note that um, obviously that questioning guards have withdrawn the offer. Once the tender closed and you've submitted your offer, conversations will commence, as I said, with each ACCO ind independently, um, with the evaluation panel and, and the ACCOs there. So we are hoping that we can work through any issues or any items that are not clear in your offer, including pricing. We are really hopeful um, that we can work collaboratively with you and confident that we can receive we can actually achieve a positive outcome from our discussions with you so that potentially it will to alleviate the need to withdraw any offers. OK, I also want to say as well is that the five care arrangement types aren't subject to change. We know that, but it is there in the request document as well that in addition to a conforming offer that communities will consider an alternative offer that addresses a different type of service delivery model under a care type, including a pricing model from what is outlined in the request document. So we know we've received a number of questions through addendums around pricing, um, but we will accept an alternative pricing model there as well. OK, but it is obviously if you do that, that it is a requirement that you must um, complete part A, the response form for each um, alternative offer that you're submitting. So I don't want to confuse you, but also I'm, I'm trying to um, alleviate some concerns that you have there in terms of when you think you may think an organisation might think maybe my offer is not going to be suitable. I'm not comfortable with this. I want to withdraw it for whatever reason. Um, but hopefully we want to try and avoid that from happening. OK, but I will take that question notes, but it could be two elements to that. It could be that maybe you've submitted an offer, but then you've decided as an organisation that at this point in time, once con conditions, um, once conversations commence, that maybe you aren't quite ready yet. And that's OK as well. All right. But we need to come to that, arrive at that conclusion jointly um, rather than an organisation just walking away. That's what we don't want to see happen because we know you put a lot of time and effort into completing these tender submissions. OK. Well, there are no more no more questions coming through, so um, please send them through to to Jackie's uh, email address after this session, which is in the chat and on screen shortly. We finish. Okay. Right. I'd just like to say, Amber, would you like to close the session off from today? Yeah. Thank you. Look. We're really, really encouraged that so many Aboriginal community controlled organisations have engaged with us through this process. We really, really encourage you to submit a response because ultimately I um, think it would be um, disappointing to have had this engagement along this way and then not to not actually end up with ACOs, lots of ACOs providing services across the state. So please, please submit your uh, response to us. Um, even if you're worried about it and you think that it might not be quite um, what you would like to submit, please submit it um, and enable us as a panel to work with you um, to be able to um, progress that through and hopefully lead toward uh, a contract starting from 1 January. So thank you very much for your time. Oh, we've got two more questions. Have a couple more come through. I knew if we rattled on a little bit longer, that might lead to some questions. So, um, <laughs> um, someone would like uh, the non-conforming um, tender responses uh, comments that you made earlier to be re um, explained. So can you please explain that again? All non-conforming need to provide a different tender response. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, so if you, as I've stated, the, the care arrangement and it's in 5.2.2 of the request document under alternative offer, and that's how we what, how we word it here in government. So basically what I'm saying is the, fair, the five care arrangement types are not subject to change. However, if you feel like you want to submit an offer with a different type of service delivery model under a care type, we welcome your offer. And that includes a pricing model as well from what is already outlined in the request. OK, so there is an option for you to submit an alternative offer, but there's also an option there where you submit an offer as per the request document. And in addition to that, you may want to submit an alternative offer. So potentially you're putting two offers on the table for consideration. If you're going to put two offers on the table for consideration, you need to have two separate request documents completed. Is that ex 
explain it. I, yeah. Um, and if a price is outside the department's price, is that considered non-conforming? No, that is not considered non-conforming. As I've said, can't reiterate this much enough once the tender closes and we've had an opportunity the panel has to evaluate assessor offers and look at pricing that's when conversations will commence okay and have you any sense of what a transition timeline might be from new to sorry from existing to new providers so we're still not completely clear and i think it that's something we're not going to be able to fully understand until we understand, and I'm using the term market disruption, um, as in how many how many children and how many services uh, are going to have to transition. Um, I'm hopeful that there's lots of new um, ACOs coming on board, and so there will be um, quite a lot of transitioning happening of Aboriginal children. Um, but because we want to go at children's pace as much as um, your pace um, as ACOs, um, we're really going to need to assess that as we go along. Um, we are very open to it being potentially a six month, could even be longer process. We know that it is impossible for brand new agencies to be right ready with a full um, a, a full load of carers ready to go on the 1st of January. So we also need to be better understanding what is going to be transitioning, whether we are actually transitioning carers and care arrangements to you or whether you are um, having to assess carers. So there's a whole lot of considerations in there. Um, again, we've been really clear all along that this is a partnership approach. So not about you without you. Um, when, when we start looking at those transition um, timeframes, that's a discussion we'll need to have with you in terms of understanding what your service capacity is and when you're going to be able to start delivering services if you're a new service. I anticipate there's some very robust ACOs out there who may well be able to start delivering on the 1st of January. So um, there's not an assumption that everyone won't be ready. So that's some of what we need to assess as we go along and we'll continue conversations with you. So please be reassured um, that we're going to do our best to move at your pace, um, but ultimately it's about the best interest of the child being our paramount consideration as we look to transition. And I believe this will be our last question for today. Um, given most ACOs are new in this space, is there an expectation they will provide multiple service types? Can I that? <laughs> There isn't an expectation, um, but we would encourage you if you feel like you have the capability in your agency, uh, I think it, it works ultimately better for children to have those options. So for example, if you're providing temporary care, we really want you to be part of the solution of finding alternative care arrangements for children. And so that may ultimately be about finding family um, and then being able to provide community foster care. So we would really encourage you to think about your service model and how you can help us move children to the least possible intensive care arrangement and to move them as far up the Aboriginal child placement principal hierarchy as possible. So we're looking for children to be out of residential or group care into family situations um, and out of non-relative care uh, into relative care, into family care, wherever possible. And we would love you to be part of those solutions with us. So um, you don't, just to be clear, you don't have to tender for multiple care types, but in thinking about your model, if you can, in terms of helping us meet those um, really important criteria, ultimately we want to see Aboriginal children uh, cared for by Aboriginal agencies and by Aboriginal people. So any way in which you can help us is wonderful. Wonder Ben, if you want to add something. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Amber. Uh, I just want to add on top of that is that I suppose what we're keen for is once a child is provided care within your organisation, if a care arrangement should fall apart or, or not work out, that you have that ability to continue to support that child in an alternative care arrangement. If you are the organisation that's providing the care to that child, you will know that child better than anyone. You will have you will be invested in that child's journey. You'll be invested in that child's future. Uh, so you are best placed to provide that alternate care arrangement. Uh, the, the other part I would add is that the experience of service providers is the broader your type of uh, the uh, type of care or the care types you provide, often the easier it is to provide care. If you are confining yourself to one care type, it actually limits your ability as both an organisation, but also uh, a service provider in out of home care to provide good, sustainable, flexible care. The bigger, the, 
the more different types, the, the more flexibility you have to be able to move workers, to be able to uh, move properties, to be able to really provide um, flexible care to children. The smaller you are, the more pigeonholed and the less flexible you become. So yes, it is absolutely better for children if you provide more care, uh, care types, but it's also the experience is it's, it's all also better for the uh, the organisation providing care. We These are Aboriginal children. We want them to be cared for by Aboriginal organisation. That is our absolute dream and commitment for this, um, and we will support you to do that. So thanks, Amber and Jackie. Thanks, Ben. I have no further queries come through at this stage. OK, so again, to reiterate, this is a partnership we really, really want to see you uh, submit your tender responses. We thank you for your investment of time and we look forward to investing in you in being partners in providing care to Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. Thank you very much for your time today and farewell. Talk soon, I'm sure. <laughs>